in any business, you should really be making making decisions, not just focus on the next quarter or next year, but you should be making decisions that look three, five, ten years out. Investment process should fit your personality. Okay, so so whatever advice I'm giving you, I'm just speaking from my perspective. That's what works with me. That's what clicks with my EQ. That's what clicks with my biases, my experiences. Um, so in our research process, we found that quality for us, is, you know, is a quality that should be uncompromising. But What's 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 changed for me over the years is that I used to be a lot more numbers driven when I was companies. So I would just you know spend a lot of time looking at balance sheet and ratios, return capital, all these kind of things. And, we st- and I still do this. But what I find now is that I spend a lot more time looking at the softer side of the business. I spend a lot of time thinking about management, their incentives, their decision making, thinking about the culture. The clarity, and this is another factor that's became very, very important for me over the years, is the how clearly management communicates and how clear and transparent the company's financials. Okay, there's this uh, great story. There's this book I like, I like uh, Lessons from the Titans, and it talks about the story of uh, Jeff Emote, G. Like you know, like there was a huge Wall Street Journal article about how. When uh, Jeff Emote flew somewhere, there was a second plane waiting for him, you know, which is a huge waste of money. But so I knew that story. But in this book, they talk about a different story, which actually really shocked me. The author, when he was talking to Jeff Emote, he said, "So when when you're traveling and you go to you come to the hotel, do you like go to the front desk to get your key?" And Jeff Emote said, "No, no, no. I have a front team. I have a team that goes ahead of me." And you know, they make the reservations, they make the room, they make sure the room is right, and then they also bring my gym. Can you just imagine what kind of arrogance you have to have to basically have people, like the peasants, basically in his mind, carry dumbbells and workout equipment so the CEO could have a quality workout and he can't work out in the the peasants' gym that's you know that every hotel has. Because remember, this guy is blowing not his money. He's, you know, he's blowing somebody, you know, shareholders' money, but it, but it also indicates that this is a person who behaves like a king of the company, not a CEO. When you behave like a king, it means you're probably going to put very little value uh, on the opinions of others. Okay, so this is a very soft example of of arrogance. Okay, and I would argue that arrogance could destroy a lot more capital than weak balance sheet. Okay. Now, what was interesting also about our General Electric story is that if you try to read the financials, if you try to analyze you know, the company and project what the cash flow is going to be one or two or three, five years from now, it was impossible because they were gaming the financials. There were always one-time charges that happen in you know every single quarter. When a company's financials are very difficult to read, it means the management it has something to hide. They don't want you to understand the business, okay? So therefore, when I look at companies today, you know, we actually when I see a company that's have a muddy financials that requires like a map to understand, I just move on. You know, that's something. When I was younger, I thought that it was me, it it was my incompetence that I was not good enough to understand the financials. Now that I have a lot more experience, I realize it's not me. I can read financials just fine. The management is trying to muddy them, so I don't, you know, just because they have most likely something to hide. If I look at every single investment mistake I made, almost every single one of them, it came from two sources: management and muddy financials. Okay, and usually those two were, you know, together. Let me explain you the problem in corporate America period. Okay, in any business, you should really be making making decisions, not just focus on the next quarter or next year, but you should be making decisions that look three, five, ten years out. Okay, twenty years out. The problem is, the ten year of average corporate CEO is probably five years at the most. So therefore, if you make investments, they're going to pay you off in ten years. You will not be compensated for these investments. In fact, you may be 
we actually get penalized because when you make investments, they, you know, they reduce your cash flows, they reduce your income. So therefore, a lot of times management is hesitant to make these investments because it goes against their incentives. Management are people. They're just people like you and me. And they get up in the morning and they think about the family, their kids, their retirement. And therefore, they'll be making decisions that will try to maximize their wealth. Okay. Now, the management that has sold in game is also going to have an alignment between what's good for them, what's good for the company. Also, if you look at Jeff Bezos at Amazon, right, he was able to make decisions that were bleeding a lot of money in the short term. A lot of investments that were bleeding a lot of money in the short term, but that paid off 5, 10, 15 years later. So let me give an example of a company where the management made a huge difference. There are two companies, Philip Morris International and Altria. These companies used to be one company. It used to be called Philip Morris. So, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, these companies got separated. Altria sells cigarettes in the U.S., I think Canada. And Philip Morris sells the same Marlboro everywhere else. Same companies. Except 10, 15 years ago, Philip Morris International started to make investment into heated tobacco. Meaning instead of burning the cigarette and creating all the, all the star that causes cancer, the cigarette is heated. So it never really burns. So this it still produces smoke and it still releases nicotine, except it has less less carcinogen. Okay, today 30% of Philip Morris International's revenues are coming from this heated tobacco. Like in seven years, they're basically saying 100% of the revenues will come from that. Their growth in that segment is coming not just from their users, like you know, people who smoke Marlboro, you know, picking up their product, but it also comes at the expense of competitors. And right now, they are not, you know, in a, in a few years, they will be introducing this product in the United States. And their gain will come at the expense of Altria. So again, two companies, identical products. One has a huge runway for growth. Uh, one is slowly go, you know, turning into kind of this decline in annuity. I mean, it's, it's still going to be around five or ten years from now, but it's going to be less profitable ten years from now than it is today. I mean, I'm talking about Altria than Philip Morris. So that would be an example of a, the difference management makes.